Michael Abels, composer for Alan V. Farrow, and now a two-time Emmy nominee. Uh, I believe this is the first documentary you've scored. So how did you get involved with the series? Hi, Joyce. Uh, yes, it is. Um, I was contacted by uh, Kirby Dick and Amy Ziering, who are the co-directors. And we had wanted to work together uh, before, but it, the timing didn't work out. And so when they uh, contacted me again, I jumped at the chance. I thought it would be a great project. I was excited to be asked. Um, so at what stage uh, during uh, the whole series did you come in? Because I, I think they were working on this for like three years, right? Yeah, they were working on this for a very long time. I only knew about it when they were in post and nearing the end and they had narrowed it down, that they knew it was going to be four episodes and each one of those had a pretty solid structure at that point. So what did, what did you and Kirby and Amy talk about once you came on board? Well, we talked about, I, first I asked them if there was a difference in scoring documentary versus film because I hadn't done it before and I didn't, you know, want to go in thinking that I knew the answer, you know, and, and they were really supportive of me doing, you know, what it is that I do. I felt like I had, you know, like freedom to really help tell the story. At the same time, it it is a documentary and you need to be conscious of allowing people to experience it as um, people telling their factual accounts of what happened, you know, and so there's a, there's a lot of you know, I, especially on the part of the directors, but also on the part of the composer of thinking about whether whether narrating in a in a whether narrating is a, a a great choice or whether it's something you want to hold back on and and just let the story uh, tell itself, if you will. Yeah, because I feel like in documentaries or just like nonfiction pieces, like the the music provides a lot of support for like dialogue, especially like during like the interviews and the narration. So, so how did you approach that? Yeah, so it, it's kind of, it's kind of a concerto for dialogue, really. There's dialogue through everything. So the first thing you have to do is figure out how music can support dialogue um, rather than compete against it. Uh, another thing is um, there are parts of the story, you know, Alan, um, Mia Farrow and Woody Allen's story begins with kind of a classic uh, love story. So in the first part of the series, there's a chance to really um, show a very romantic uh, version of two people falling in love and, and of New York City being the backdrop for that in, in a very grand and, and romantic fashion. And then, but then there's also, um, tr you know, th then there's a lot of investigations and people talking about technical things and, and um, court testimony and during that time the music i think needs to provide momentum so that people can can digest this information and get a sense that it's really leading to something um and then but then there's also firsthand uh witness accounts of of traumatic experiences and and moments like that i think um the audience is very engaged with with um the person who's who's testifying, if you will, and they want to know whether they believe that person. And I think that that's a very personal experience that happens between the viewer and and the person on screen. So at that point, the music really needs to back away and not try to influence people at all so that they can really feel like they're being allowed to get to the truth of what happened without anyone telling them how to feel. Mm -hmm. I did like uh, like when you mentioned about um, Woody and Mia falling in love in the beginning and like a classic like romantic story because the music is so different there too and like it, it felt like you went for a real like jazzy like New York vibe which makes sense because he's so associated with New York so how did you go about scoring that section? Yeah that was a very conscious choice because I think one of the things that we all remember about Woody Allen films is the the way he depicts New York City as being a wondrous, magical uh, a dreamland and, and the heart of the, the world um, artistically and socially and everything. So, um, and he, in, in his films, he always chooses music um, very carefully and, and, and jazz is one of the things that's associated with his depiction of New York City. So uh, it was great fun to imagine um, that I was, you know, a, a, a jazz composer and a, a jazz songwriter and writing themes to 
to fit that version of New York that he and Mia were falling in love in. Um, at the same time, also, uh, Alan's really known as a clarinetist. So um, when we, a lot of times there are clarinet solos, which are in, in some ways represent his voice and his response to what's going on. But it's also a way to, I mean, a larger scope to thread the different styles of music into the film and to have it feel integrated, even though sometimes we're seeing very different sorts of situations, you know, they're not all romantic, obviously. Yeah. Well, like, like you said, like there's a lot of tones in this project and the case is very controversial and the subject matter is very serious. So what was the most difficult part of just striking the, or finding the right balance between the music? Yeah, that, that's actually really what it was. It was knowing, especially in the, in the, in the moments that are the hardest to watch to make sure that the music doesn't, um, you, you know, doesn't intrude or, or step on those moments, but only supports them um, because they are, they're very raw to watch and they don't need any, uh, nothing, they don't need any additional dramatic element <laughs> to have them be, um, be felt by viewers. And so there are moments where music is really like the romantic parts early on really helping tell stories. And there's times when the music is really just being very cautious and quiet. And that was the most important thing. Yeah, because um, in the fourth episode, which uh, is what you submitted, there's the scene with Dylan and her husband recounting like the triggering moment for her. And then the scene with the first time she's talking to uh, Frank Mago, who decided not to prosecute like 27 years ago. And it's the first mm -hmm. time we've seen each other. And, and yeah, there's no music behind that. So like, is that like, you know, instantaneously you just thinking like, we don't need anything, You're just like skipping that section completely? Or do you talk about it with like Kirby and Amy as well? No, I, we, we talked about that. And we uh, also the, um, the editing team um, were very much part of the um, Kirby and Amy's um, method of working seems to be to work um, collectively. And uh, they have, they all are very musically savvy about what music can provide, you know, for film and, and they would try different themes uh, in under different scenes and talk about, you know, whether a whether the theme works and b whether the scene is supported by music at all. And even if I hadn't gotten to that scene, then just hearing them talk about what the concerns were would be very informative to me. And I would, you know, I was always up for writing music for a scene if they thought that it might be helpful. But at the same time, there's a lot of music <laughs> and and sometimes you also silence is actually an important part of a score and choosing which scenes uh, play dry is actually as important as figuring out which ones uh, need to have the big music cues. Mm -hmm. Well, in that same vein, like after like a, such a serious scene like that, such a big moment like that, you know, for Dylan, like meeting like, Frank Mako for the first time in almost mm -hmm. three decades, like, how do you come out of that? Because then there's like music in the next scene. Like, how do you know like what what's the right tenor there? Yeah. Well, it it if you have a scene where there isn't any music, that actually kind of sets you up as a composer to to just the mere fact that music's going to happen kind of in effect is a page turn. You know, you, you go, oh, and now we're on to something else. So um, the, the, a period of silence helps set that up. If you've, it, sometimes if you've got a, a music cue that's very uh, intense and is really driving, uh, you know, an emotion or action in a scene, it's then how do you transition in the next scene and still have it feel fresh? Um, so with the, in the filmmaking, I, they also were very much conscious of, okay, this is emotionally heavy, you know, how, what in what comes next, how do we give the audience a break or let them, you know, cleanse their palate if you want emotionally. And so, um, because uh, the filmmakers were knowing that that was an important part of people being able to understand the story, uh, I could just feel what they were doing and kind of respond in the same kind of, same kind of tempo, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, so now that you have a, a documentary under your belt, like how does it compare to scoring like a narrative feature? Mm, how, how is it different? That's a great question. It's the, uh, in narratives, you do have scenes where it's really just the visuals that carry it. 
Uh, and so you have chances where it's it's you're going to have whole sections without dialogue. And I didn't experience that in a documentary. So that would be um, a big change. And also there's the interesting thing about about scoring terrible, terrible things that happen in a film. They're still not real, you know, and then when when terrible things happen in reality, it requires a much lighter touch um, for it to be effective. Um, it's because maybe the cinematic experience um, kind of makes things seem larger than life. Um, but even though I mean I'm saying this right now, but then I can think of examples that are exceptions to that. So to that, so I don't know. I think really maybe it's each project, regardless of whether it's a documentary or a film, requires just looking at what's the best way to tell the story and approaching at it fresh each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, case by case basis. Uh, well, Michael, it was great speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you back in a little bit.